I am Madison Timmons. I'm Chris Susi. And we're paranormal specialists who live in the most haunted city on earth, Savannah, Georgia. Every day is Halloween in our line of work, so join us as we spin true tales of haunts, murders, and disturbing Savannah history. I'm Madison. I'm Chris. And, and welcome, welcome to, to the most haunted city the, on earth. Bop, bop, boom. Oh. Another good bloopers content video yeah. would be just how many sounds does JT make when he sits down? A <laughs> woman, old man. That's great. <laughs> All right. All right. Let's hit it. Hello and welcome to another episode of The Most Haunted City on Earth. My name is Madison Timmons. And I'm Chris Susi. And we have a gory episode for you today. We're going to talk about yellow fever. Yes, Savannah's nightmare, honestly. Uh, it was probably one of the worst things that has happened to Savannah. But uh, let me go ahead and just kind of dive into the history of yellow fever for those of you who don't have any clue what that is. It was a very common illness here in the South, uh, especially because we are known for our mosquitoes. So if you visited any portion of the South during the summertime, you'll know that we are just in clouds of mosquitoes all the time. And so yep. basically Savannah had outbreaks every 25 years of yellow fever. It was a disease that really quickly took you because once you had flu-like symptoms you're pretty much too far gone at that point um, most people lived after they contracted yellow fever about three to seven days it took them very fast you had symptoms of jaundice so your eyes your skin your nails all turning yellow the reason why it's called yellow fever also you would bleed from every orifice of your body you would vomit blood that looked like black tar and if you were actually wealthy enough or alive at that point to have a doctor come to see you, more than likely you were going to get treatments such as bloodletting, leeches, and having turpentine shoved down your throat. And one of the worst years that we had, we had multiple really bad years of yellow fever, was 1820. And a lot of reason why people like to talk about that year in specific is because we had 666 people die in the span of three days here in Savannah. And so that, you know, AIDS. What, for, what, are, the, what do they call that? The, the devil's number or the devil's disease. Bum, yes, bum, yes, bum, yes bum, they call bum. it the devil's disease here in Savannah for that reason. But also because it was just horrible. It was literally like being cursed because you pretty much were rotting and bleeding internally, you know, that's never going to be a pleasant way to die. Yeah. So Chris, any, uh, any, any ghosts that you know of that are like yellow fever ghosts? So multiple. Yeah. If I were to, to name one and it's fascinating because the Sorrel Weed House is famously haunted by a woman that they believe threw herself from the roof of the building uh, after finding out of an infidelity of her husband, uh, and her name is Matilda, and she haunts the building. And so people oftentimes will say that they see a woman in a black dress. But what people don't know is that she was not Sorrel's first wife. Ooh. She was the sister of Sorrel's first wife, and Sorrel's first wife died of yellow fever. What makes that interesting to me is the effect of yellow fever starkly affects your appearance. And it was believed that Yolanda, I believe mm -hmm. is yeah, her name. Yeah, I believe that's right. Uh, y Yolanda, who died of yellow fever, during her suffering was made to wear full-length black and a, sh a veil to hide her Ooh. face because being sick was a stigma and if people saw her, because on top of the jaundiced features and the blood coming out of everywhere, <laughs> there are also lesions. There's also, so it's very easy to tell when someone was sick with it. So apparently in her pain and in her agony, being made to cover herself from head to toe, she would simply walk around the house wailing because oh she was God. in such pain, because she was dying of what would be considered 
just yeah. a horrible, horrible way to die because it's a long, drawn out process. Yeah. So they were like, they were like, you. They were like, Yolanda, you're depressing us. Put this on. <laughs> or no, think of the family. Yeah, that's exactly it. It's Save your, face. Your appearance is just Literally. too horrible. Yeah. But. yeah. Cover up. <laughs> Cover up. Um, and it, it was, it, nobody really talks about it, but a lot of times when people see the ghost or they talk about the ghost, they see this woman in black. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, and and I'm, I'm, I oftentimes wonder, because everyone will attribute that to Matilda, or Daniel Radcliffe. Um, nice. Yeah. Um, they'll, they'll, uh, they'll attribute it to Matilda, but I, I oftentimes wonder if it's not the first wife who died of yellow fever. Mm. Um, and, and in many episodes, that kind of makes the sense. Um, but that one springs out in my mind. And then there's also the fact that we have a mass grave yep. uh, in Colonial Park Cemetery. And in Laurel it's Grove. Like a, it's yep, like a, in Laurel it's like Grove a also. recognized mass grave. Like, it is. Like, it has, has a whole placard. Yeah, yeah they have a, like a whole placard and everything. Yeah. Yes. Um, <laughs> yeah, the mass grave in Colonial Park Cemetery, um, and I will clarify, if you go to visit it, and we can even put an insert of the plaque, um, it will say nearly 700 people died. Right, because they, did they didn't want to put the devil's number <laughs> on a big plaque <laughs> in a cemetery. That You know, it's the South, so... Um, yeah. But it is actually 666, so God, we're so not making... Savannah, isn't it? It, it is. is. Well, I swear. Again, yeah. I feel like a city face, like Boston would have been like... Oh yeah, let's put the number on there. <laughs> well, they, uh, Boston honors their grave robbers and their common cemetery. Um, their, right. Yeah, you know they they honor but, that. They're very different people up there than but, it is here. But yeah, Chris, you were saying that like like that's that's so Savannah. It's like to save face. Yeah, to, to save like, face. Save yeah. face. You'll, you, if you go through enough ghost stories, you'll find that many of them are about people who were wounded and they they wouldn't allow them to get medical treatment to save face. Yeah. You know, I think that's the, the story of um, Wesley Espy, uh, who, who was attacked by uh, gangsters, and his father, being a judge, didn't want people to know that his son was attacked, and so he, he let his son basically die in the parlor mm-hmm. of his, of his what? house. Uh, yeah, the Espy house. The Espy house, mm-hmm. yeah. Y'all, y'all looking at me like I'm like an expert. Well, you, but you've been I'm just here for the dad enough. joke, right? <laughs> <laughs> I'm just here for the dad um, joke. Um, and then we, we, you've got the mass <laughs> graves. So I, we have talked about the Davenport house, mm-hmm. which wow. we yeah. believe you know, is, is, is a ground zero for yellow fever uh, yes. hauntings. Yep. Uh, and yes. then, of course, the morgue tunnel. Absolutely. Uh, yeah. There on Forsyth Park uh, is, is, is primarily a yellow fever story. And we'll save that one for the for the, the episode we're doing next. For Forsyth. But I do Forsyth like to next. talk about the um, uh, doctor at 12 West Oglethorpe, yep. too. Oh, yeah. Um, because his is such a sad story so with, sad. with yellow fever. It's a very depressing story. So, basically, he was one of the main doctors who would treat people with yellow fever. Because you got to remember at this time they didn't realize that mosquitoes were spreading the disease. They thought it was the bodies. So a lot of people did not want to be a doctor to the yellow fever patients because they didn't want to risk catching it. But this doctor, um, he lived in what is now uh, Husk, the restaurant in 12 West Oglethorpe. But basically, he was walking home one night and he felt super sick all of a sudden like it was like stomach pains and things that brought him to his knees on the front steps and so a lot of people believe that he like went through this inner turmoil before he went into the home of like I shouldn't come in like I'm gonna eventually bring this plague to my family but when he goes into the home his child is already dying of yellow fever. And so he spends the entire night trying to treat his child with yellow fever and trying to save his life, but it's not enough. And so he would eventually go into the super dark depression because every single one of his family members would die of yellow fever, his wife, his other children. And he would pray that eventually it would take him as well. So it would take him out of his misery. And he feels like he was the reason why his whole family died because he thought he brought it into his home. And so eventually the way he ended up passing was that he went into the first child who passed his bedroom and he boarded it up. He closed off the windows and he locked himself in there with no food or water. And he ended up dying of malnutrition and dehydration. And so 
that was kind of the end of the doctor's story, but it just shows how brutal the disease was because it can wipe out a whole family so fast. So Yeah, and it's interesting to note that the the building, 12 West Oglethorpe, was abandoned and empty for mm-hmm. decades. And the prevailing ghost story was if you go and you knock on the door and call out for help, the door handle would jiggle as if the doctor was coming to help because the ghost story that that manifested in the in the aftermath of all of it was that he would never turn away helping people so if you if you knocked on the door you would draw his spirit because he would want to help because that's his, his whole his whole idea and ideology is he will come to help you um, and so a, a very famously haunted building which deserves its own show um, but that specifically creates this heartache, this heartbreak, because a lot of people didn't know the full breadth of the story. All they knew was that a doctor lived there, and if you call for help, he'll answer the door. Mm-hmm. And then when you learn all of those extra elements of the story, yeah, you're like, why. oh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Well, he, he's one of the spirits in Savannah that are very humane, very gentle. Very benevolent. Yeah. yeah. And... Um, you don't get that a lot with a lot of spirits that are choosing to stay on this side. Um, there are some spirits that are choosing to stay on this side for, you know, reasons of they want to cause torment or sometimes they're so bitter about their death or, you know, sometimes they can't cross over, but it almost feels like he feels like he needs to continue helping others even on this side. And it's worthy, worth noting that benevolent spirits don't have as much impact as tormenting spirits. Mm-hmm. Because benevolent spirits are not trying to get your attention. They're not trying to do things. You know, if they're helping, they're helping in ways that are probably barely perceivable. Whereas, you know, if you're trying to torment someone, they got to know that they're being tormented. Yeah, yeah Otherwise, it, what's the point? So, you know, it's, it's an interesting uh, statement to say that we just don't talk about benevolent spirits much because their impact on us is almost subliminal. You know, uh, uh, not very yeah. invasive at all. Um, I will say that, and again, for another time, um, 12 Us Oglethorpe was a school for a short period of time, and I spoke to some of the kids, well, they're adults, but when they were kids, they went to the school, and they reported it being a woefully haunted building. Really? Oh, yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah, we can go uh, into that in another episode. Yeah, that's, that's yeah. another episode. <laughs> yeah. Pretty, pretty cool. Okay. Well, um, you know, I had a, what, what, what about the doctor's get up? Like, I know that the doctors wore um, like a, a, a face shield, almost like, like, a cloth. like a cloth over their face and all of that. What do y'all know about the... Um, Yellow about, fear protocols? Yeah, yeah I mean, I know, that, I know it's not like super ghosty, but I find it kind of interesting. You know, if y'all don't know oh, much about it, it's dark history. Um, well, it's... The problem you is... Know, the fact checkers will come in and be like, right. um, they didn't wear this. Well the, the, well, the problem is it's hard to fact check because it's not super well documented right. of uh, what they wore. It's not like the plague doctors during the bubonic plague where it was very well documented of right. what they lots wore. Lots of illustrations, lots yeah. of... And, you know, it had to be known that the plague... So they, they, they literally made rudimentary posters... So that when you see this, you know, bird-faced thing coming out of the, you know, smoke, yeah. you, you don't freak out. Because um, their belief was that if you put uh, flowers the, the herbs, in, in, yeah. into the cone of the mask, it filtered the illness. Um, and I want to say there was rudimentary hazmat-like suits uh, or, or gear that they would wear, you know, cloths over the face and, and, yeah. and even like long, you know. Well, uh, sure. Yeah. A lot of times... Uh, whenever there would be like epidemics like that, they would wear leather. I know yes. that too. Leather well, was a big part of uh, it because they believed like leather was hard to penetrate, so it would oh. be difficult for the you know um, airborne pathogens to get in through your leather suit sure. of sorts. But like I said, it especially in a place like Savannah where they don't necessarily want to talk about the darker Absolutely. side of medical it's practices. It's so hard to find the backup uh, records, like trying to find stories or accounts even. Like your best bet is like if you can get a hold of a journal or a diary. Yeah. That was your best hope. But even those are hard to come by. Yeah. 
I bet. Mm-hmm. Now, um, I know that Madison, you you love the story of the body man. Yeah. So right. So tell yeah. tell us the story. Tell us the story of the body man. So the body man. I also love the story of the body. The body man. men's are uh, body men are interesting because, like I've said earlier, um, basically they thought bodies were spreading this disease, so they needed to get rid of all the dead very quickly. So. Pretty much when you were declared dead, you were wrapped up and you were put out on the front porch and picked up by body men to be taken to Colonial Park Cemetery. When you had yellow fever, they didn't really have time for a big grand Victorian funeral. Those were a very lengthy process. And if they thought you were basically a biohazard, they wanted to dispose (laughs) of you. Um, so a lot of times the body men were kind of people who were of the lower class. They were people that society deemed less worthy of expendable. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. They were people that they didn't care if they got the disease. So a lot of times they were the ones that were, you know, working all hours of the night. But some people actually ended up getting buried even in their backyard. Um, If the family didn't want, you know, to have their loved one go into a mass grave with a bunch of other random people, they would actually bury their dead on their property. Yeah. Um, But that's solely because they couldn't do they couldn't do the Victorian funeral process where, you know, you'd have to send out a servant to go notify the entire family or all your friends or whatnot, because there if you died in between biweekly periodicals, there wasn't a daily news at that point. If you died in between those periodicals, somebody had to go out and actually tell people that you died and then you had about a week before the procession and then the procession had to be led by the sexton the person who was the head of office at the cemetery you had to like arrange all these things you had to have pallbearers you had to have people who would carry your uh your body there also you couldn't have an open casket at your viewing at your wake yeah you know a lot of reasons yellow fever a lot of reasons why you couldn't have those sort of things which makes it interesting to note um, why we might still see a lot of these yellow fever patients is because I would say about 95% of them did not get treated well at all in their burial process. It was honestly kind of disrespectful how they treated the bodies like trash, pretty much. Like they're like, just got to dispose of it, got to put them in the mass grave. And there yeah. are fundamentally unmarked graves. Yep. You know, fundamentally, their name is not attached to their body. They do not have the same reverence or the same uh, conditional expectations for the respect you pay to the dead. Uh, in fact, uh, many people will argue that the placard itself that states that these people are buried here was a cautionary, we got to put something here or yeah. all these dead are going to exactly. you know, really invade our, our world, um, which is tragic in its own sense. Very much you know? so. The, um, it, it's also, it was such a, a traumatic event. And like I said, it happened every 25 years. Mm-hmm. That's a lot of people to be touched by this illness. And that's also why we see a lot of spirits like the little boy that we saw in the Davenport house. Mm -hmm. You know, he was having to do the really awful The grunt work. Yeah, the brunt work of taking care of these patients. And that's why you still see impressions of them because, you know, having to change someone's bedpan and... I was um, thinking about that bucket too. Yeah, the ghost bucket that everybody's obsessed with. (laughs) Well, another possibility of the bucket itself is bleeding, which was a common treatment. You know, where did that blood go? It's very likely that they used a pail and they cut the the victims and they they would bleed out. And in many instances, it was that that sped them to their death. So, you know, you're carrying the last bit of life away from the, <laughs> yeah. the person, you know, that's, it was, it was something that like had, had occurred to me that the bucket could also be from bloodletting. Also. Um, which. So head on over to the Davenport house and right. meet the little boy ghost that carries around a bucket of blood. Ah, a bucket of blood. Well, especially during their yellow fever presentations that they do every year. I wonder if he watches this and he's like, yeah, that's pretty accurate. You know, it's, uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'll tell you what, the Davenport house is super cool, y'all. You need to, if you come to Savannah, you have. 
have, you have to, to go, go see visit. It. it is beautiful, very well kept, and uh, you know, just uh, owned by pretty good people, from what I can tell. Absolutely. Oh yeah, um, they are, they are very nice yeah, people. They really keep that house pristine, which is pretty dope. The um, <laughs> and to answer the question of uh, the people in the comments are like, was the bucket still there? Like, what happened to the? Bu-? A lot of people are obsessed <laughs> with the bucket, um, with the with the little boy more so than the little boy. They're like, yeah, yeah, the little boy is cool, but the bucket, um, yeah, it went with him. So <laughs> yeah, that, that is a yeah. part of him. Also, also, you know, there were a lot of there were a lot of skeptics, you know, because of course, even though that did look like a little boy with the bucket and all of that, um, there were a lot of skeptics saying ghosts aren't real, right? So, you know, or or that's that's something that's there in the hallway all the time. Well, okay. Go t- go on to DavenportHouse.com. I think that's yeah, what the it is. Davenport yeah, House they have, Museum. They have a Matterport like virtual tour. It's completely free. Go go try to find that. <laughs> yeah. Go try to find that anywhere in any of the rooms. You can go everywhere. You can even go in the attic in that bad boy, mm-hmm. huh? I mean, I'm just that's all I'm saying. Yeah. And also I, I something we didn't touch upon when we went through that story was that I was working in that house by myself. So I with that area is off limits to guests and uh because there's no electricity up on those upper floors it's very dangerous to be up there if you don't know where you're stepping because the steps are like this wide and like things like that so we would often put these ropes up on the steps so no guest was going up there but even if they were i would have been frightened because they were in the house with me by myself You know, um, but I had gone up to that second floor already that night to get the ropes because that's where they're kept. So I would have noticed if there was some kind of mannequin there. Um, also for the question of why is the photo so blurry? Yeah. The, that, that's a fair question because people are like, was this taken in 1976 with uh, whatever? Yeah. Um, when you have cameras that are... Even though I believe that was taken with... It's a screenshot of a FaceTime. It's a a FaceTime, yeah. Yeah, So, so, yeah, I mean, you talk about the level of compression, just coming from a film expert, the level of compression, you know, uh, uh, of that image is... It's 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 awful because it's a zo- it's it's already compressed via FaceTime over cellular data, and then you're zooming into it and then you're screenshotting it. I mean, I mean, you're gonna get a pixelated well, and image. And it wasn't good lighting, anyways, because yeah, I had to ha- I had to have a flashlight with my camera walkie talk or like my my um, company walkie talkie. Yeah, it was garbage lighting it was basically meant to show you this far ahead of you so you don't trip and bust your face open that was about it so 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 with um with that go ahead check that tiktok out if you haven't seen it um i am i am actually going to approach the davin the owners of the davenport house uh this week uh so we can see if we can go in and like yeah, shoot some exclusive there, right? yep. yeah there, yeah there's people filming there there's people filming there I mean, now. i'm just saying that it, it, it might be locked up yeah yeah. It might, yeah yeah it might be locked up but i'm gonna try to i'm gonna try to go there you know when it's not when that's not happening and uh and and just talk to them about doing some tiktoks doing uh you know a mobile podcast and then also uh filming in there ourselves so we're, yeah so we're, we're gonna go for that um and you know I'll go on to our Patreon because we're going to have if I can accomplish all of this we're going to be uploading some exclusive content on that too but moving uh moving forward past Davenport House uh we Savannah was actually afflicted by another disease slash illness and I wanted to ask if y'all knew anything about it um it has something to do with the building on Oatland Island (laughs) and and they immediately got it all right skiffleless Skip for TikTok pur- purposes. Oh, skipless. Skipless. <laughs> so they don't. <laughs> yeah, because TikTok, y- y'all know, um, the yeah. clock app is uh, very particular yes. about. So, so with syphilis was a really big deal in Savannah at, at the point in time. Um, but could you could y'all talk about that a little bit? Because I mean, that's that's worth talking about. It. Oh, absolutely. And that building's stupid haunted. Because yeah, of I it. did an overnight there. You did over really? Yeah. Of course uh, you did. And it was Chris. it was terribly intense. And what we would learn later, um, so it was originally built as a retirement home for railway workers, um, and then it became this uh, 
syphilis treatment facility, but surprisingly what we learned was it was actually linked with the Tuskegee experiments, if you're familiar with that mm-hmm. at all. They were actually withholding treatment to see how far and how terrible mm. the syphilis can become. So people were literally being observed as the syphilis was uh, destroying them. And to make matters even worse, uh, they had an entire ward of children. So these are children who are born with syphilis, and they were monitoring the effects of the disease on youth, and they were not treating them. They were not giving them proper treatment. Uh, They did have like an iron lung, and uh, there were occasions where... uh, People were in this iron lung for, for a long time. When we went, the iron lung was still there. All the centrifuge equipment, all of the research facility equipment. Um, so there was a lot of suffering in that building. And, um, and they weren't just Goodness. Savanians. There was just the region, the entire region. If you had syphilis, it was kind of like an asylum. Uh, however, we would learn later that many people were just not treated. They were tortured. You know, uh, basically. Basically tortured. That's not um, basically, that's torture. Well, they were left to their own devices in, in a lot of ways and observed. You know, to me... That's a form. Yeah, it's a form of torture. Yeah. Uh, to me, they, they, the way they looked at syphilis at the time was it was an affliction of vice. It was, you know, and, and, and in many cases, uh, you know, they just wanted to know... And this is disturbing as all get out because th- this is medical experimentation on humans... And it didn't end there. Uh, as a matter of fact, that facility became a facility where they tried to weaponize mosquitoes. Mm-hmm. And so they would like, they put yellow fever, yep. dengue fever in mosquitoes to see if they could weaponize them, drop them on, you know, enemies. And, and they released them on the public of Savannah. Who? Who's they? Who? Who's they? The United States government. Stop. Yes. Mm-hmm. And you can look this up, I believe. Y'all, if we're not here next of, week, you know why. It's a part of... We're going to get shot. <laughs> Oh, they, were, they were posing as the World Health Organization, but it was actually the United States government. They were weaponizing mosquitoes. It is actually where I believe where flea collars came from, surprisingly enough. Mm. Because while they're working with these mosquitoes, the researchers had to use industrial strength uh, insecticide. Mm-hmm. And they, they were working on little labs with little mats. And what they do is they cut strips of the mat and tie it around their wrist to keep the bugs off of them. Well, uh, for fear of being infected by mosquitoes that they've, you infected. know, infected. <laughs> so, uh, so it's very interesting. They, they, uh, uh, I want to say that this that program uh, would happen. In, I, I, they did it in Florida. They did it in Savannah, and they actually released it on the general populace. What? Yeah, just to track the disease. How far would this disease uh, track? When did they do that? In nineteen fifties. Here? Yeah. Yes. And I'm pretty sure it's declassified. I'm pretty sure you can find these documents mm-hmm. online. Yeah, I believe they briefly mention it, too, in Midnight, Midnight in the Gar- Garden, Good and Evil. Yep. The, guy, the guy who had Stop. the flies, they do. He, he, he tied flies to himself, mm-hmm. and he had a, a little vial of poison that they said that if you put it in the water main, it will kill everyone in Savannah. That little vial of poison was a part of the project that they were doing out on Oatland Island. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah, and everybody was afraid of him because right. he worked on that mosquito project. Yes, and they're did. so yeah, they um, and they, they would they would like, is he having a good day? Yeah, they're yeah. like, is he gonna poison the water today? Yeah. Um, but yeah, that area, if you go over there, it's now a really wonderful wildlife refuge, uh, which it is, is it, was, it was amazing. I got to pet a wolf. You pet the wolf? Yes. <gasps> yeah, I want to like, pet the wolf. Now it's like now it's like a happy little zoo. Yeah, for kids. And yeah. like, you know, they're like, come look at our possum. And, you know, it's... I, I love their possum. I know. And I want to say that they've, since our overnight, they have renovated the second floor. But the second floor was like, they still had oh, cots yeah. and beds. And they still had um, the, the, uh, the remnants of the... Um, the lung and the centrifuge and all the, like, it was like a laboratory. And uh, one of the scariest things that happened to us was we were in the, um, in the attic and there was a wheelchair up there. Mm. And 
we never caught it on tape, but we're pretty sure that wheelchair was moving. Like every time we looked at it, it was like it was it just looked like it was in a different position. But <laughs> we were so convinced that we started to like camp out watching the uh, the wheelchair, and we start hearing like ticking, like tick, 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 and we're like, "What is that?" And it got louder and faster, and we're like, "What is that?" And so we start following the sound, and it was an old Geiger counter, and it just started going Stop. off, and we're just like. Something radiating? radiating? Yeah. Oh my god! Because there is a site on the what? On, there is a site on that land where apparently they would irradiate living things no to see the effect of radiation on things. Um, and some people argue that they did it on inmates. Some people, you know, lots of stories come out sure. of it. But it was a bunker. Wow. And, and I want to say, like ten years within the last ten years, they had to do a major like hazmat removal <laughs> of the bunker. Wow. Yeah, yeah well, the 1950s are crazy, y'all. Crazy. I mean, <laughs> honestly. <laughs> I want to find some of those documents. You I'm should sure. be able to. I, I, I feel like I've read at least at least the Deerfield yeah. experiment. But, yeah, you look prob- it up. You probably can find things on, like, Georgia Historical Society. I will say Georgia Historical Society has a lot of resources Absolutely. that you can access online that are – so great for learning about Savannah's history. They don't really go into the paranormal side of things. No. That's usually on account of trying to get to know the people who work there. They leave um, that up to us. Yeah, they do. They leave that up to <laughs> us. Um, but if you want to learn about historical events, and uh, especially for like spirits that you've heard of, it's a great resource. Wow. Um, that's crazy. Though. Yeah, that's, With- that's, that's wild. I knew, I knew when I asked that question, Chris was going to just go off. Well, yeah. There's just some questions I have up here, and I'm like, Chris can go off on that one. Well, I mean, (laughs) you can feel the energy whenever you go to Oatland Island. It it feels so different over there, especially because it's a very isolated feeling area. Um, Whenever, because obviously it's on an island, but it feels like you're not in Savannah anymore. It feels like you've kind of stepped back in time because they have that area that is built to look almost like a little village, too, back there. So. And the, the, again, without any true corroboration, that was housing for um, security and supposedly they had convicts that they would experiment on. Oh my So Lord. like you could trade time in prison for, oh. uh, for, for volunteering- Syphilis? Uh, no. I think this was more of the, the yellow fever, dango fever, oh, uh, yeah. uh, biological weapons. Yeah. Uh, t- testing. The Trade radiation. time in prison to get yellow fever. But nobody knew exactly what it was. It was come and do this experiment, experiment yeah. and we'll eat wow. less in your time. None of that is corroborated, but that is what they say. Those, that village, because there's mm-hmm. like a, a strange dorm-like yeah. situation. Yeah. And They're- they believe that they kept uh, volunteers who would come in and, and, and have different things taken. Because everything that they did was at such small doses that it would not necessarily be lethal. Um, wow. But there are, there are stories. Yeah. So y'all head over to Oatland Island, support them, go see some ghosties and cute pigs. Cute pigs. Yeah, pigs. Yeah. And wolves. Real cute. And wolves. wolves. Yeah. And wolves. But, but, but it's for real, though. It's, um, you, you feel like you've stepped back in time in that area and it feels like it would be a good place to hold these experiments because it's so isolated. And I can only imagine in the fifties, it was probably even more so isolated with how much tree growth is around there. It feels like, remember in American horror story, that season of, um, with the, it was like a psych ward season. Yeah, the asylum. The asylum, yeah. Mm -hmm. It felt kind of like that. Well, that's why it was chosen for this, for the syphilis, um, Asylum. Uh, it was, like I said, it was originally a retired railman's uh, yeah. convalescence house. And then uh, when it turned over into this hospital setting, it was, it was very much like a hospital. Because it, it was For huge. Sure. It's a big, big building. It is. So going uh, back to yellow fever, uh, how would, I guess this is, this is kind of a weird question. It's always something that I've wondered. You know, there's so many spirits uh, in Savannah, and when you see them, 
or interact with them. Uh, is there anything that's like a telltale that they were afflicted by yellow fever? Because Madison, you always tell me, you know, and Chris, I think you've said this too, that uh, spirits are made when something violent and brutal happens to them most of the time, I guess. You you, you know, I, I feel like you've said that. Where One it's condition, like, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. So, so, you know, obviously yellow fever is something brutal and violent, um, and, uh, and it takes them quickly. So there's definitely a ton of yellow fever spirits, I'm sure, around here. I guess my question is, you know, how would you differentiate a yellow fever victim versus, you know, that guy that got hit by the car? Well, it, it's interesting because of the fact that sometimes they look sick. Sometimes. Not always, though. Not always do you, when you pass over and you become a spirit, you don't always look like exactly how you pass. A lot of times you look like a version of yourself, but it doesn't mean that you have all the, the oozing, you know. Yeah like sores or, you sure. know, that you're not bleeding from your eyes or whatever it is, you know. So a lot of times I find with yellow fever spirits, I've only come in contact with a couple of them. I know that there's more here, but I've only seen a couple of them. It's usually a sense of confusion that they have. Like, almost like they're like, wait, am I actually dead? Like, is it over? Or yeah. because, because it's an illness that takes you so quickly – it sometimes is a bit jarring for spirits because they're like, wait, did I actually die? Sure. You know? These were otherwise healthy people. And that's to keep in mind that uh, we, I, I talk all the time about like the conditions of haunting, the reasons why the dead bother the living. Uh, one of the main ones throughout the world talked about is unfinished business. Unfinished business is basically when a life is on a trajectory that you're expecting to have things happen to you and you die. That's why children have so much potential. There's so much life ahead of them that the unfinished business is so monumental. So when you die young and healthy, your spirit has that, I had more to do. I was going to get these things done. So sure. that concept of confusion, of, 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 of I'm supposed to keep going. Yeah. I'm supposed to have more. You know, I was supposed to have more life. Um, you know, uh, and, and it's, it, it, uh, on the converse, a lot of times when people have yellow fever, they actually know they're going to die. So there, yeah. is, there is a moment of, for a lot of them, the acceptance that this is the end. And that helps you know, uh, mitigate the spiritual conflict of life versus death. Sure. But for very young people, very fit people, very strong people, and people who are taken uh, exceptionally fast, these are things that could easily leave behind the remnant of, of, of potential, potential life. Yeah. And that potential life, depending on how grand and amazing it is, is pretty much how powerful the spirit can be. You know, okay. the spirit can be as powerful as the aspirations of the life that was taken. Sure. So if, if you were on your path to becoming the president of the United States, you know, there was a lot of potential that you put into your trajectory. And when it's interrupted, the trajectory goes on even if you don't. That makes me feel like if I was killed today, I'd be like a a, a ghost for sure. Well, yeah, yeah exactly. Like, oh, yeah, no. because I, I've got so much I got to do. I'm like, still got to make movies. Well, I feel like it is partially a choice for some spirits. Absolutely, yeah. You know? I don't want to say that that's the only. Uh, it's a condition. Yeah. It's, okay. It, it is partially a choice that spirits choose to stay here for unfinished business you know it's not necessarily like they die and then something else is telling them like you didn't finish out your life's mission sure you got to stay as a spirit in this plane because not all spirits want to even if they do have unfinished business not all of them want to stay as a, a spirit on this plane but there are you know, so like, let's say if you died today, you very likely could want to stay here, but sometimes you, when you die, your decisions are different. I, yeah. I, this is what I'm speculating, you know, is. Yeah. Um, no, I'd be just making movies well, in this, heaven. It's funny because it kind of, um, I came up with a theory about basement ghosts and attic ghosts. Basement ghosts and attic ghosts. 
anytime you go into a haunted house, anytime you go into a place where, where people are like, oh, this is scary, there is an innate knowledge that there are two places you don't go. You don't go into the basement and you don't go into the attic because the concept is there's a ghost in the attic and there's a ghost in the basement. <laughs> but the thing about a house is you spend very little time in the basement and very little time in the attic. The basement and the attic are unlikely places for a spirit to hang out. It doesn't make sense that you'd have a haunted basement and a haunted attic, although all around the world, people will tell you, don't go in the basement, don't go in the attic. And it is my belief that there are ghosts who don't completely understand why they're still here. And they branch into two simple factions. One, they know that they're dead and they want to have the death experience. They just don't know how. But they know one thing. We put the dead under the ground. So they go down to the basement. They go down to where they believe they belong. They belong under the ground because they're dead and death releases them. And so they're instinctively doing the thing that makes them uh, in their life experience, they should be under the ground. The others are people who do not want to be dead, who do not want anything to do. They will go as far away from underground as possible. They will go to the attic. They will go oh. to the furthest space that they can access to prove that they don't belong under the ground. And of the two spirits, I will deem the attic ghost more dangerous than the basement ghost. Wow. While the basement ghost might be more scary, <laughs> the attic ghost is more about fighting, more about resisting what's to come. So that becomes a thing. Uh, and, and so oftentimes, even when we're not dealing with attics or basements, I will deem something an attic ghost if it is here in spite of death, mm -hmm. like, wow. like choosing against death versus a ghost that is happenstantial understands it's dead, wants to go to the next place, but doesn't know how, and is just kind of trapped. And so in my estimation, those are the two types of spirits oftentimes, and they're not the only ghosts, but uh, I, I got asked this question, uh, you know, growing up, people would ask me, it's like, why, why are there ghosts in the attic? Why are there ghosts in the basement? What is it, you know, are they you know, tinkering in the basement? Are they, you know, what is it? And, and the question was good because like, we don't live, we don't live in our attics. We don't live yeah. in our basements. You know, if anything, it's storage, mm -hmm. literally storage. It's where we put, <laughs> things, we put things that we don't want in our main house. So why would there be a ghost in the attic? And why would there be a ghost in the basement? And so over decades of, of observing ghosts and talking about ghosts and listening to ghost stories, I came up with that theory. And I think it does kind of I treat like this yeah. idea of, some ghosts are aware that they're dead and choose to go on. Some ghosts are not aware that they're dead and refuse to accept that they're dead. Mm -hmm. And so they cannot go on. I actually definitely agree with that theory. Um, and I'll tell you why. It's because of the Davenport House attic. That place is just uh, its own world practically um and, and you I, can't take a photo up there without captioning yeah i, I actually i actually have by the a way if we do a, an investigation there let's do it in the winter yeah in the winter oh because it gets hot yeah. <laughs> it's oh it's so hot, hot in there <laughs> um yeah but the um yeah i actually have a photo of a spirit in the attic of the davenport house and we can insert it but yeah. uh basically that attic, I've mentioned this before, is painted haint blue. So haint blue when it is traditionally that color that you paint to ward off the spirits. If you paint on the outside of your house, on the shutters, or on the top of your porch, or something like that, it's a good ward to keep spirits away if that's what you're wanting. But when you keep it on the inside, it just keeps them in. So on top of that, the attic always was active, consistently. Anytime I was in that house by myself, you would hear the doorknob to the attic go, like it would just spin in a circle constantly. Like it would stop and then you'd hear it. It would go and it would like click and it's a metal handle. So it's very loud echoing throughout this empty house with just me. So um, it would be like that. And 
every time I would bring in somebody, you know, to train or whatever, anytime we would go close to the attic, they would feel like someone was standing behind them. Or if you go into the attic, you always feel like someone's watching you or things that of house that is nature. So haunted. It's unbelievably it is just haunted. So- haunted yeah it's oh my um gosh. but if that is the case for an addict spirit being uh, being more malevolent or being more willing to fight makes sense why they're the strongest presence that you would feel would be up there and same instant with the davenport house the spirit in the basement the little kid that people see th- that kid's not going to do anything it likes to run up the stairs and it likes to move things but you know it's really not anything yeah that's gonna hurt you what feels like it could hurt you is up in that attic you know so yeah i like the i like the basement versus attic i i love that theory yeah i know i saw you smiling literally the whole time well yeah so into it well it's so true yeah it's it's so true so um my last, my last question, we're going to end the, end the podcast here soon, but, but for any of our listeners that you know, either live in Savannah or want to come to Savannah eventually or are planning vacation in Savannah and they want to visit some yellow fever hotspots to maybe capture some yellow fever ghosts or you know, just be in the presence of them, uh, what are some, some hotspots that they can visit? You can have dinner at Husk. We know that. Yeah, you can have dinner um, at Husk. <laughs> um, you can go to Colonial Park. Colonial Park Cemetery is like ground zero for so many yeah. spiritual intersections. So all around uh, Colonial Park, all around Colonial Park Cemetery is, is, is good. Yeah, definitely check that out. Um, you can visit the Davenport House. I'm not going to say you're guaranteed to see specifically a yellow fever patient because of how many things it's been, but your, your chances of seeing something. And Forsyth Park. Uh, Forsyth Park also, Forsyth you know. Park, yeah. Um, those are like the main spots of yellow fever. But to be quite honest, yellow fever af- affected the entire city. Mm-hmm. So you could be staying in an Airbnb that could have been a home for somebody who was ridden with yellow fever. And we have no idea of it because there's no documentation. Well, and there's no way, given you know, uh, the, the epidemic spread, that it didn't affect people. So just the collective sorrow of an entire city in the throes of an epidemic where, you know, someone you know died because of this disease. So there was a, th- these periods, periods of woe that were so intense yeah. and so tangible that, and I've seen people experience this where they're just walking and all of a sudden they're just hit with a wall of sadness. They just sense that they've, they've experienced something and I think it's the collective, you know, uh, nature of losing that many people and, and, and it being so centralized and so, because, you know, Savannah was always kind of small. And so, you know, when 666 people fell dead, that was a good part of the population yeah. of the time. <laughs> you know, I want to say in uh, the 1870s, it was in the thousands and it, mm-hmm. it represented like 20% of the population dying. Yeah. And that's significant. That's oh, yeah. an amazingly significant amount of people in a small, you know, network of people. Sure. Having it's, these interactions. It's also a visceral reaction to not know how you're going to, if you can catch this disease, if you have it, are you carrying it? It's, think of it as how when COVID first came about, how f- paranoid and scared everyone was about this illness that we don't quite understand um and how how much fear people had that's a lot of energy that goes out so especially if you contain it to a small area like savannah with that same intense amount of fear of not knowing whether you could die next week from this disease and we had heard accounts of when people were affected with this disease there's a period where the discomfort, the sheer discomfort of it would not allow you to lie down. So you would walk. You would just walk uh, to, to try to alleviate. You know, before you lost your, your, the strength to walk, you found yourself moving because lying down wow. your skin was like 
if it pressed against things, it really hurt. It really was very uncomfortable. There's lesions happening everywhere. So you, you, the only way you could feel anything. So imagine these shambling, zombie-like bleeding from their eyes and their mouth, their lesions. Jeez. You know, yeah. that was a, a, a horrific sight to see somebody literally dying before you but not able to rest. It's not a restful death. No. Wow, it's, that's that's creepy. That it, needs a, it is that creepy. needs a movie. Yeah, <laughs> it practically is. Let's make it, Chris. Right? Easy Do peasy. it. Well, you know, easy peasy probably about a mil. All that makeup. All that makeup. <laughs> we'll get there. We'll, yeah. there. we'll get there. We're, we're moving. Join our Patreon. Yeah, yeah join our Patreon if <laughs> we'll you want to see a yellow fever. Step. We're going to do it. Yeah. If you want to see a yellow fever movie, but for sure, for all sure. Right. All right. Do you have any other questions, Chef? Nope, nope. I think I think you answered all my questions. All right. Well, if you guys have any suggestions of things that you want us to talk about, please feel free to let us know. You can comment on the YouTube video. You can comment on our TikTok, on our Instagram with suggestions. Also, please feel free to leave any questions that you have in our Q&A button on TikTok. That way we are for sure going to see it because sometimes the questions that people leave get lost in the comments on TikTok. And there goes JT's water bottle. But, yep. Uh, With that being said, though, we're going to go ahead and wrap things up. This has been a fun episode. Uh, We have lots of fun things coming on to TikTok, Patreon, all of that. Uh, So if you do want to support us in that way, we do appreciate you guys. And so I'm going to go ahead and say let's – we'll see you in the next episode. So my name is Madison Timmons. I'm Chris Susie. And stay spooky, y'all.